Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Chad. If you don't know me, one of the pastors here at Pleasant Valley. And this is weird. Um, I'm so used to seeing your faces, uh, but we're going to go with it. And we're trusting the Lord to meet you where you are. And that's the cool thing about the church is it's not a building. It's actually people who have Jesus living in their hearts. And so we're scattered today. Uh, we're actually joined with billions of others around the world who are also worshiping um, kind of in a place of hiding as well and being quarantined. So last week, uh, we were in a series in the book of Genesis. And after the service, just spent some time with some of the other pastors and really felt God just say, press pause. And we want to jump into this new series this morning called Quarantined with Jesus. Uh, and just want to let the Lord speak to us. And so I'm going to do something. We're just going to pray. And if you feel comfortable, I know you're in your house, so nobody can see you. Um, probably good. Some of you are in your PJs. Um, but just if you feel comfortable, open your hands. Um, well, as I pray, we're just going to ask the Lord to meet us. So let's pray together. Lord, uh, this is indeed something none of us have experienced before, and we really do need you to meet us here. And so God, we just uh, here symbolically open our hands to you, uh, not only to listen to your word from your, the scriptures this morning, from your spirit, but also for this season in our world to say, Lord, whatever you want to do, I'm open. And where I'm not open, would your spirit pry me open? Where I am calloused and hard, Lord, would you soften me? God, would you speak to me this morning? Lord, we give you this time. We ask that you would meet us in your word, that you would meet us in the midst of this crisis. And we pray this in Christ's name, amen. So here we are in this crazy time of kind of being quarantined. And so even with our best efforts as a society, and I mean, amazing art, uh, scientists, just really smart people, uh, we've built great buildings, we do all these wonderful things, and yet a microscopic, uh, we can't even see it unless we look with a microscope, virus has brought the world to a standstill. Like we're actually crawling now. Like we've been slowed down so much. There's probably, I think they estimated over 2 billion people today that are at some level of lockdown, shelter in place, quarantine, and you're among them. And we're all just sitting back saying, I wonder what the news will be next. What do we do? This virus doesn't distinguish between rich or poor. It doesn't look at your religion. It doesn't look at your skin color. It doesn't look if you're a celebrity or if you work the factory line. It just says everybody is going to pay attention and everybody is going to respond. So we've been brought to our knees. And if you're like me, there's all kinds of what ifs. What if this happens? What if my family member gets it? Um, there are lots of people who are doing the what ifs of like, what, the, what if this is a, just a big sham? What if all of this craziness has caused me to lose my job or caused me to lose my retirement? I've seen people on both sides. And I've been on both sides. I'll just tell you, I'm back and forth. And you're probably that way too. You watch the news. There's a clear distinction of people who are terrified and panicked um, to the level of, I know I've heard stories of seniors who have been sitting in grocery parking lots with their windows up, waving people over and speaking through the window to somebody younger to say, can you help me get groceries? I'm afraid to go in. To the other side, and this side seems to love to post things online too, to say, you are all just a bunch of fools. Why are you doing this? You're causing all this problem. Here's the thing though. Um, and I know that it's, it's affecting us. Like, I want you to take a look at this first picture. Um, you've probably seen some version of this picture of grocery stores with toilet paper of all things. Um, although if you think about it after a while, if you, do, if you don't have it anymore and you can't get it, it's a problem. Um, but we've been affected that way. I've never washed my hands so much in my life, so much so that I actually had to ask Lisa, how much lotion do you put on here? This just feels really greasy. I don't like this because I don't use lotion and my hands are crazy. While the shelves have been emptied, our minds have filled with questions. And we've started to ask about things of what is going on really? How much am I gonna lose here? Will I lose my job? Who do I know right now that will get this virus? Will I get it? Will one of my family members get it? Who do I know that's on the front lines? 
Today, I have a family member who is on the front lines working at Winona Health in the hospital with a mask. I know other people in our church working those front lines and they go in and they are standing right next to it to help. And, and so we have these questions running around, but I, I wanna push in and this is kind of where we're gonna look today and over the next few weeks and however long God has us in this thing, I want you to ask another question. Because right now people are saying, oh, it's this, it came from this place of the world. And oh, if only we had done this and only if our political leaders had done this and man, the blame game because it's affecting us and people are mad about it. And so we wanna blame. There's another question though that we need to be asking. And it's the most important question to ask. And it's this, what if Jesus has put you in this quarantine? What if he is allowing this? Now, not saying that he's the God from heaven with a lightning bolt that's like, huh, I wanna see what happens if I do this, you know, and blast people. But what if in his sovereign power, he is allowing this? I'm gonna show you this other picture. And it's another shelf that's empty, but it's, uh, it's the Bible section at Walmart. And it has been ransacked. So people, yes, they're filling their carts with food and you've done it too, you've bought stuff. Um, but others are saying, you know what? I think maybe I'm gonna grab a Bible too. Why are they doing that? Why are we doing that? Because I think that question, Lord, are you allowing this? What is going on? What do you think about this? God, where are you in this? What's your greater purpose in this crisis? So when we wanna know what God thinks and we wanna know how he acts in a crisis, we go to his word. We actually look at a story in the Bible to where we see truth. And so if you have a Bible, we're gonna be in Luke chapter five, just a little short story that we're gonna look at this morning. One you're probably familiar with. If you don't have one, the words are gonna be on the screen. You can also just close your eyes and listen. But Luke 5, 17, I'm just gonna read the first half of the first verse. Um, and we're gonna ask Jesus, what are you gonna do in a crisis? And here's the first part of the verse. On one of those days, and I want you to imagine a day in history, as he was teaching Jesus, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. On one of those days, he was teaching. Can we all agree that right now we're in one of those days? And man, is it a doozy. In 2020, nobody thought we would have these kinds of days. But I want us to think about something else. In the same way Jesus here, nothing was random. For Jesus, one of those days is strategic. It's planned, it's on purpose. It isn't accidental. Every day is strategic. Even his, the Bible tells us every day is written down for each one of us. So March 29th, the year 2020 for Jesus is one of those days written down long ago. And where is he? in this crisis? Lord, where are you in this? God is right in the middle of COVID-19. Right in the middle of COVID-19. He's fully present. He's on time. He's willing. He's working and he's ready. But we don't always see it nor do we know what he's doing. Sometimes in our impatience and pride, we actually won't see it. Can I encourage you today? Don't do that. Don't push aside what God might be doing. Don't push aside what he might be doing. Don't waste your quarantine. Don't waste your quarantine. If he is behind it, and I think he is, I think he's sovereignly working, don't waste your quarantine by trying to blame somebody, by being angry or mad, or how could this happen? You know, I was thinking about that song, he's got the whole world in his hands. We used to sing it when we were kids. I'll be honest. When I think about it, I find myself wondering, like the Psalms, and it's okay to wonder these things, God, are you sleeping? <laughs> are you silent? Are you so far away that you forgot what's going on here and you let something slip by and you were up there in heaven kind of like this and all of a sudden you're like, oh man, I can't believe COVID-19 just happened. But I did see instead a very clear picture this week. And instead of a God with a lightning bolt shooting down something, or a God who was asleep and not knowing what's happening, I saw God reaching his hand out to the world that is spinning and kind of just slowing it down. This loving, 
gentle hand putting the brakes on the world. And whether you agree with that or not, the brakes are on, aren't they? We've stopped. We're sitting tight. And then we might say, well, God, if you're behind this, how could you let this happen? Didn't you see this coming? So I want to talk just a minute about God in time. God is outside time and space. He created it. He is not bound by it. So he doesn't think the way we do. And we thought, man, a year ago, 2019, we were fine. We didn't have this virus. And God doesn't sit there, look at the timeline and say, oh man, look at what's coming. For God, COVID-19 has always been in front of him. He sees past, present, and future simultaneously. So what does that mean? That means he's sovereign, he's in the middle of it, but more importantly, he's speaking. So what is he saying? It's a fair question. Okay, Lord, you're in the middle of this. What are you saying? What are you trying to do? So let's ask him. Let's look at him in this teaching moment. In a, we're gonna see a crisis. Let's watch what he does. Let's watch what he says. Look at uh, the next half of verse 17. So one of those days, Jesus is teaching and the power of the Lord was with him to heal. Behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed. They were seeking to bring him in, lay him before Jesus, but finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof, let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. So let's talk about who's here. People crowded into one room. No social distancing was happening in this room. Everybody is right near each other. They can smell the guy next to them. Okay, it's close. They're packed in. Why are they there? They're hurting. They're sick. They're without hope. They're in need. They're longing for something. They don't even know what it is, but they know they need to be here with Jesus. They've got this deep ache in their hearts. And while they're packed in, somebody, this guy who's paralyzed, can't get in. He can't get close. He's, it's too crowded. There's not enough Jesus staff. There are not enough beds. There are not enough ventilators. There's no answers outside of Jesus either. He can't get in there. And there are others who are leaning in, listening, hoping to be healed physically and spiritually, who also just told the guy at the door, no, no more room. You can't come in. So it's kind of this crazy mix of, I want to be healed by Jesus. I want to hear him speak. And no, you can't come in. This is our place. And there are others there that actually don't think Jesus is the answer. They are the steady hecklers that always came, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. One, they're afraid he's gonna take something from them, but they're there to oppose him. Cast of characters, people, paralyzed man, Pharisees. And then this is the group I want you to think about. Because honestly, I think this is probably the one that we will need to connect with the most. There are those and I'm talking about these friends of the guy who feel the earth slowing down. Now for all these years, they've watched him and they've seen him paralyzed and they're like, oh, we can't do anything for you. Hey man, here's a little money, here's some food, but we don't know what to do. They feel the earth slowing down and at a crucial moment of clarity, as the earth spin is slowing, they look at each other and they say, We've got to get to Jesus. We got to get our friend to Jesus. Nothing else matters right now. Now think about all the heartache, isolation, maybe money wasted, prayers unanswered for these many years for this guy. He's been paralyzed for years. Why now? Why is God doing something now? For these guys, they get it. They realize all that matters is to get our friend to Jesus, to hear his voice, to have him touch our friend. So if you could interview one of these guys, and there's lots of people like this that I plan on talking to in heaven. Um, so I wanna talk with one of the guys who dug through the roof, okay? And if you could ask him, hey man, what were you thinking? What were you thinking in that moment when somebody said, no, you can't come in? Who was it that said, let's go to the roof? And I hear them saying maybe something like this. Well, up until that moment, we'd just been living our lives. Yeah, we saw the guy with paralysis. We knew him. What could we do? The world was spinning fast. And then all of a sudden, we knew something was different. We heard about this guy, Jesus. And they knew that the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And so what they said, 
They said, we've got to get him to Jesus. No matter what, we have to get him to Jesus. They don't care about the crowds. They don't care about the naysayers, the Pharisees who were there just to oppose those pushing them back at the front door. So they go to the roof and they start ripping up the roof, tearing apart somebody else's property. Who cares? This is what matters. Of everything that was happening, there's a simplicity here of a before the crisis and a during the crisis. And before the world's spinning, everything's great. We're not doing anything for our friend. Then it happens, a moment of clarity. And here's what happens. Sometimes God has to slow us down, even isolate us. Is he doing that right now? I think so. Isolate us to get us to hear him and to see clearly. So very practically, why does God allow trials, circumstances, suffering, COVID-19 to happen? Is it so we can just lose our money in retirement? Is it so that people can suffer needlessly? I don't think so. That deeper question of what is God saying is so that people will know they have to get to Jesus. That's why everything that has ever happened in history that is difficult, trials, circumstances, God works all things for good. What is the definition of good? It's you in a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's to get you to Jesus. So how does Jesus respond in this? Look at verse 20. When he saw their faith, and these are the guys that feel the earth slowing down. He said, man, I love that. Your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees started rah, 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 beginning to question saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them. You gotta love that. He hears your thoughts. And he said, why do you question your hearts? Which is easier to say your sins are forgiven you or to say, rise up and walk that you may know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And immediately he rose up before them, picked up what he had been lying on, went home glorifying God. And amazement seized them all. And they glorified God, were filled with awe saying, wow, we have seen extraordinary things today. We have seen extraordinary things today. I love this. When he saw their faith, he said, your sins are forgiven. What? Jesus, that's not the problem. He's, he's paralyzed. Didn't you know? He's, he's paralyzed. That's why we came. Or let's put it in our current COVID-19 crisis right now. Jesus, we just need a vaccine. That's it. Just give us the thing that will get rid of this problem. Help us. Let's just solve the problem, Jesus. At a very practical level, you may think we just need a vaccine for this to all be over with. Just like these guys thought, just heal him already. Just fix the problem. Lord, just stop the bleeding. We got a health crisis. We have a financial crisis. There's a financial strain on our economy, on the global economy. We have friends and family who've already lost their jobs, been put on furlough. I'll tell you right here at Pleasant Valley, our staff, sure we're anxious. Of course we are. We count on the Lord's provision and guess how that comes? You, <laughs> there's no bones about it. You, you give and that's how we get to keep doing this stuff. And so are we thinking about our jobs? Sure. Lord, we just need you to fix the problem. We just need money to come back up. We need the stock market to find its place again. And we need the health crisis to be over with. And can we just move on? Can we just move on, Jesus? We need a vaccine. Lord, we just brought him here for healing. Can you help him just walk again? And indeed, eventually that's gonna happen here. But there's, that's the surface of the story. That's the surface. There's something else going on. So what's happening on the surface? It's the story about Jesus healing a paralyzed man, a man who, mind you, had had a disease for his whole life paralyzed. So that's, that's the surface story. But God doesn't always just work on the surface, does he? Let's go deeper. Under the surface, it's about the faith of some frontline friends who are saying, you know what? I feel the earth slowing down and I think I'm gonna do something about it. It's also about the maybe unbelief of the paralyzed man. Because 
when you're feeling it, and we all could admit this, when you're feeling it, your faith is probably like this. <laughs> it's so tiny when you're in the middle of crisis. You're like, okay, fine, I believe. But he's probably, he's needing their faith because he doesn't have it. It's also about the contempt of these other guys who not only don't believe, they're actively opposed to anybody else who does and to Jesus. And it's about those other people who are just kind of leaning in, wonder what's going to happen here, who eventually are going to say, man, we've seen extraordinary things today. So let's break those people down and let's break those people down into our current crisis. You have those who have it. There's the paralyzed man. Those who have the virus, those who are suffering right now, there's the guy on the mat, he can't do anything for himself. He needs help from everyone. You have those helping who realize I can do something here. I can pray, I can serve, I can lift the mat. I can say no to when people tell me I can't come in and I'm gonna go up on the roof and I'm gonna dig through the roof. You have those complaining, the Pharisees who are afraid Jesus is just gonna take from them. They're upset, they have contempt, they have unbelief. We have people like that right now too, don't we? And then there's Jesus. And he's the one person most of us haven't thought to look at yet. We see everything else happening. We gotta go one layer deeper though to get to the real point of the story. The real point of the hand on our earth, slowing it down in orbit, telling us, stop, I will isolate you. I will move you from your businesses. I will take away everything that you have found hope and comfort in. And I'm going to get you to slow down, to listen. The real point of the hand on the earth is so that we can hear what he's trying to say. It's about a God who has come close to reveal himself to us. Notice the Pharisees say this, hey, only God can forgive sins. Who do you think you are? Ah, that's right. I'm God. That's right. He's there to reveal himself as God come from heaven to save. And he's come to heal us for sure of physical ailments, but he is here to heal us of the one virus the one virus that will take all of us, sin and death. Nobody will be spared. And Jesus says, yes, I will heal physical things. I will use them, but I'm here for the bigger problem, which is why he says to the guy, your sins are forgiven. That's where he starts. Could Jesus just snap his fingers right now and make this whole thing go away? Boom, everybody's healed, vaccine, yay, the world is cheering, the stock markets are roaring, everybody's happy again. Could he do that? Yes. Is he doing that? No. And our question remains, why? Why is Jesus choosing to use the maybe unbelief of the guy who's paralyzed and the faith of the friends who are willing to step in? And I think the faith of the friends is the best picture of the church that you can have right now. Of people who are willing to say, we're gonna go deeper. We're gonna look past all the surface stuff. Why is Jesus choosing to forgive sins when we think he should just fix the body? He should just fix the problems. Why does he choose to allow unbelieving Pharisees just to stand there and keep looking at him with their incriminating stares as they question him about why he is acting like he's God? So as we finish, where are you in the story? That's, that's what the Bible's supposed to do, by the way. You find where Jesus, where God is in the story, and then you ask yourself, and where am I? Maybe you're the guy on the mat right now needing help. And maybe you possibly have this virus. Maybe you lost a job. Maybe you're like, give to the church. No way, man. I don't have any enough to feed my family. That's okay. You're needing. You're needing others to step up for you. Maybe you're the Pharisees. I've been there who think this whole Jesus thing is just a nice religious sticker to put on a really big problem. Or maybe you're one of the friends, and this is really where I wanna challenge you. Maybe you're one of the friends who needs to get creative. What does digging through the roof look like right now? I'm gonna show you a quick video of uh, just a family this past week uh, who was having to get creative, watch this. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hi, Daddy O. Wake up, Nova. 
Hi, Daddy. Wakey, wakey. Look over. Wakey, wakey. Hey, how are you? <laughs> Love you. <laughs> I know, I can Knocked see. Out. Oh, it's okay. You're making me cry. Is she beautiful or what? She's everything. <laughs> she is everything and more, isn't she? <laughs> oh, my God. Lamb to your eyes. I love that video. And I know I, I got <laughs> choked up this week as I saw them being creative. Uh, the great grandfather behind the glass, the young couple, hey, daddy o, here's your little great granddaughter, um, having to get creative, having to figure out ways to love each other well. Right now, we're going to need to do that. And I want to encourage you as you think about where you are in the story to ask the Lord, Lord, how can I hear your voice during this time? How can I serve during this time? How can I give during this time? I'll tell you right now for the Ellenbergs, we know, and we've already seen it, and it's happening around the world with churches. Giving is going just like this, which leads to the anxiety. And so the Ellenbergs, we're praying and we're asking the Lord, can we give more? Lord, if we can do it, please tell us. The main thing is you having this conversation with the Lord, what can you do? For some, it's gonna mean going to a neighbor um, maybe just through the glass saying, hey, can I pray for you? Texting, calling, can I get groceries for you? Praying for somebody you know that doesn't know the Lord, that maybe this would be the thing that would cause them to say, I think I'm ready. I read a story about a, a reverend in Italy, which has been super hit by this thing. Uh, his name, I love his name, Giuseppe Berardelli. Um, he's 72 years old. He was given a, a ventilator because he has the COVID virus and there was a younger patient who needed it in his church. So he said, have mine. He died. <laughs> Blows my mind. Only somebody who's listening to the Lord does that kind of thing. Anytime you see common acts of grace and goodness happening, it's because God is turning the dials and pulling the strings, causing us to pay attention. We need to go deeper. We need to listen to his voice in the middle of the crisis that needs real answers for sure. But we need to realize he wants to do something greater with the world and with us. And the only voice that matters right now is his. Encourage you to listen to it. We're gonna move into just a couple more worship songs. Uh, if you're still able to get the stream and able to comment and wanna put a prayer request up there, we would love to pray for you. Um, let's just spend the next few minutes in our time with Jesus. I'll let the worship team take it from here. God bless.